Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And this is the third in a series of uh, interviews that you did while on the Telerik tour in Europe. That's right. It was the Telerik Modern Web Tour. So we talked, I actually did a talk on the history of the web, which uh, for whatever reason I'm turning into this historian. I really had a good time putting it together. Cool. Just some great, hilarious anecdotes, different bits and pieces that came out of that. Cool. And then uh, Laurent would do a talk more, more about Blazor. Mm. Our, our friend Sam Basu from uh, Telerik was talking about a lot of UX and and uh, thinking about chatbots, things like that. Mm. And then we'd always wrap up with a .NET Rocks episode. Yeah, very cool. You know, you'll notice I had both the Engstroms on. They were traveling with us uh, on this trip. Yeah. And so I sort of throw Jimmy in at the last second because I wanted to torment him about HoloLens. Yeah. Because he's, you know, he's been doing a lot of field projects, prototypes and things for different companies. And he has a really interesting insight on construction with HoloLens. That's cool. Well, I can't wait to hear it. But first, we have this little matter of better know framework. <laughs> All right, dude, what do you got? Well, speaking of Blazor, mm -hmm. this one came across my desk or my inbox, if you will. It's a project on Code Project called Music Notation in Blazor. Mm, I could see why you would sit up and take notice, you musical person. Yeah, right? yeah. A music notation is difficult uh, in a browser because there's so many little inflections and things. And yeah, sure. I mean, you can scan a piece of music and put it in a you know, put it on a page. But right. the really cool thing is being able to take something like a MIDI file or MIDI notes and generate the notation, you know, from it, which is obviously uh, graphic heavy, but not really. I mean, there's, you know, you have to draw the lines and you have to put the notes and incidentals and keys and all that stuff in. But it is really kind of complex. It's not an easy task to do. Well, I got to think just like you could figure out from the MIDI data what the note frequency is and say, okay, well, that is a C sharp. The question is when you're putting up the notation, do you put the sharps in the staff or do you put it on the note? And that's just one of a million little details yeah. that you have to, uh, yeah, that you have to account for when you're doing notation. Sure. And that's why the, the notation apps that do it really well are very expensive, you know, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they put a lot of work into that stuff. So not a simple problem. Yeah, so this obviously is working in Blazor and in the browser. It's notation in the browser. That's very cool. I love it. I don't know how useful it is, but it's pretty freaking cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just, again, we're seeing more and more examples of the power of C Sharp on the client side and yep. uh, what, that, what that looks like. I can't wait to see where Blazor ends up. Now that uh, with Google working on Golang in WebAssembly as well, I just wonder if we're not going to see more motion there. Yeah. Love it. I think so. Okay. That's what I got. Who's talking to us, Richard? Grabbed a comment off of Jimmy's show, show 1324, which we did with him back in July of 2016, talking about all join. So this was a, it was that sort of smart home IoT technology. Right. And I, I poked him about this when we were getting ready to do the show. It's like, hey, tell me, how did all join go? He goes, ah, all join kind of died. Huh. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of these interesting realities that – trying to build these collective agreements on protocols, it's hard to do. Yep. The comment I grabbed off of the show was not about all join at all, actually. This is a comment from Mailer, who's actually kind of yelling at me for a very reasonable reason. He said, great show, but Richard's belief in how simple it is to fix some aspects of security with HTTPS almost made me drive my bike into the ditch in disbelief. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't do that, dude. Don't hurt yourself. No, it's not don't good. do that. From an end user perspective, HTTPS is nice and easy once it's in place and works, but it often includes many details that can go terribly wrong, depending terribly on- Terribly wrong. Terribly wrong with certificate management, crypto ciphers, all this stuff. And it's also a moving target, which needs to be updated. And if you've been hanging out on the .NET Rock site lately, you'll aware if we've had a little update problem with our own certificates to keep current and be update to be safe and secure. Yeah. And you're right. Mailer- it's always a mistake to say something as simple. It is never correct. I don't think a single case it's actually correct to say that. My my mistake. Maintaining a properly secure website, e even if you're just looking at the HTTPS aspects, is not a trivial thing. It is re represents a constant level of concern, effort, and validation. So the least I could do is send you a copy of Music to Code by. Yeah. And so a copy of Music to Code by is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code by, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, 
we'll send you a copy of Music to Code by. And definitely follow us on Twitter. He's at Rich Campbell. I'm at Carl Franklin. Send us a tweet. We'll make a note of it. <laughs> oh, jeez. I didn't even <laughs> see that one coming. I'm, I'm <laughs> scarred now, just like that. Uh, I kid. do apologize. Got me. It's Dink. just right. gratuitous, gratuitous right bad the, humor. Right in the pun muscle. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so I can't wait to hear this uh, interview that you did with Jimmy. So let's roll it. Hey, Munich, it's .NET Rocks. We have had a great day here at the Modern Web Tour. We're, this is our last stop. We're here in Munich, and uh, we have a surprise guest in the form of Jimmy Engstrom. I don't know where you came from. <laughs> you just mysteriously appeared last night. I have this bio from your last show, which was a couple of years ago, and I'm going to read parts of it anyway because it's funny. Because he does say you are a true geek, and I wouldn't argue with that. And back in 2011... He actually became Geek of the Year in Sweden, because they have that in Sweden. They have. Geek they have. The <laughs> uh, been a Windows Development MVP for, I don't know, five years? Five, five years. Five yeah. years, yeah. And runs a user group called Coding After Work and a podcast with the same name, and I've been a guest on that. And you can check it out at codingafterwork.com. Welcome, sir, and thanks for being on. Thank you. Glad to have you here and glad to be in Munich. I uh, love the opportunity to just sort of chat with you a bit about the sort of state of HoloLens sure. and maybe talk a bit about development methodology and so forth. Because I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, do you feel like we're kind of in a holding pattern? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, um, we, we're waiting for the next uh, version of HoloLens. Is it all about the hardware? Is that what's killing us? Because they did do a, they've done a software update recently. Yeah. Uh, and actually, was there a lot of uh, interesting stuff? Uh, we have research mode nowadays. Hmm. We have we can uh, read more from the uh, sensors and stuff like that. So um, open some doors to some low level programming. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So th I mean, the software update at least means somebody was working somewhere. Like, I made yeah. me happy when I when I saw I needed to update my Hololens. Exactly. And I had to get it out and, and tinker with it a bit to get all that stuff done and get your identity squared away. You've got one. Yep. Just one between you and Jessica? Actually, we have two. Okay, of course you would. I mean, yeah. we're two people. We have we got to gotta have two. Well, you don't want to argue uh, about it. No, right? no, no. So you actually have one each. The whole lens is mine today. No, <laughs> no that no, doesn't work no. that way. But yeah, we're waiting on... Oh, I thought we'd have hardware by now. Yeah, so Microsoft, apparently, they skipped a version two and yeah. w went straight to the third version. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know when, but hopefully soon. Yeah, I, I would think this year... Because yeah. I, I had the sense that the second version was skipped for the VR hardware that came out the end of last year, the sort of the Christmas hardware, the Asus stuff and those yeah. sorts of things. Did you get a chance to play with some of that? Yeah, we actually got, uh, we got two of them. We got the Dell one and uh, the the more polished Samsung one. Okay. I really love the Samsung one. Hmm. I, th I thought the price point on those were really compelling. Yeah, it's like uh Three hundred ninety nine dollars, I think. US? No, it's four ninety nine dollars so US. Yeah, a five hundred dollar US unit, because even the Vive and things like that are more expensive than that. Yeah, and and uh, the Vive is actually, I mean, if you want to have uh, headphones and the nice uh, head mounting uh, experience, you actually right. have to go even further. Right, it's going to be really, really expensive, and to that resolution as well. They've got the higher resolution screens and stuff on them. Yeah, the Samsung has. The Samsung has a good resolution screen. Yeah, it's a, it's a, in parity with the uh, HTC Pro. Nice. Yeah. Okay, and it's like they're more than, than 1080p screens uh, per eye. Oh, I should definitely know these numbers. Well, well, why wouldn't you memorize all of the numbers, Jimmy? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but high resolution screens. Oh, but I also thought the big thing was high frame rate, like 90 frames per second. Or uh, hertz refreshes. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about the refreshes either. Actually, uh, I apparently don't know the specs in my head. Ah, uh, okay. That's <laughs> it's only me that does that, because uh, that was the whole thing with the Oculus Rift. The difference between the dev edition and the production edition was yeah. that they went to this higher refresh rate that seemed to help with motion sickness. Do you, do you find you get affected by them? Um, I get affected uh, by most of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I try the Oculus one, and uh, well, the dev kit like ten seconds. I had to pull it off you're, because you're ill. Uh, yeah, and uh, that was a low refresh unit. That was why yes, the dev unit yes. was as cheap as it was. Uh, I did feel it with the uh, consumer version as well. Hmm. Uh, the HTC Vive, I've never felt sick at all. Interesting. Uh, PlayStation VR, I felt sick. 
with the Dell and the Samsung headsets, so far, I've noticed lagging, but I haven't felt sick. Interesting. Yeah, so just, it's almost like it's better to draw, to ha- pause for a moment and lag to catch up yeah. than it is to keep dropping frames so that your motion is out of sync. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there's a conscious effort there in the software side. Could be. To have non-nauseating lag. Yeah. One of the things that I'm really excited about is the um, uh, the controllers. Right. Uh, I mean, the controllers are... are For the um, Samsung? Uh, both of them, actually. Okay. Uh, the, the tracking. Because with the HTC Vibe, we have the, the laser grid that is uh, tracking the controllers. And so you uh, have these little units you have to put in the room? Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, and they're tracking the, the con- contro- controllers all, all the time. What's the downside to having those? You Just because you're trapped in a particular room? Uh, you have to have it in a particular room and you have to mount them. Right. Of course. Okay. As opposed um, to not needing to do that at all, just yeah. not having one. Because Oculus doesn't have them. Yeah, but they have cameras instead. Okay. So they have, uh, if you want a, a full 360 degrees tracking, you need three cameras. On So this is placed around the room. Yeah. So we're still putting objects in the room with Oculus and with Vive. Yes. Okay. But the Samsung and the Dell. You just put the headset on and it's going to track the environment and it's going to track the controllers. Okay. But uh, since the, the tracking is actually part of the headset, mm-hmm. uh, basically the controllers are only going to be seen by, by the, uh, the headset when you have them in front of your head. So you get rid of that shadowing problems, all of that sort of thing. Yeah. Are they going to be able to see it if you put the controller behind your head? It, it's not going to see it. Right. But uh, the controller has some awesome software, so it's actually going to do a pretty good job and, at guessing where the controller is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so, so good enough that you can do that shooting behind your head kind of effect yeah. in the games, that kind of thing. They they have apparently worked a lot with these kinds of technologies. Do you also find that being able to see your hands in the VR space helps with the with the, the motion sickness? Like I the, guess so. Because you have the yeah. controller, so now I mean I have definitely had that effect of your arms by your side, you can't see them in the view, but as you yeah. lift them up and you see your hands appear in the VR view, it's just seems a little more real. And I just wonder if it helps people's frames of reference help them fight that motion sickness effect. That, that might actually help. Yeah. yeah. Okay, put your hands in the right place is a hard part of this equation. Like, it's not a simple thing, especially when it's fully blocked. Yeah. Where the AR tools, like, I just wish AR was doing better than it is because, it, to me, it seems like superior technology. Yeah. But in terms of what people are actually getting results with, what people are buying and the, the, the software for, it's all VR. Mm-hmm. I, I guess that AR and VR, I, I see them as two completely different uh, things. Yeah, I think I'm with you. Um, I mean, VR uh, is is when you step into the game. Right. And AR is when the game is stepping out into your world. Yes. But from a development perspective, I, I mean, in some ways VR is easier because you just simply own the whole world, yeah. control everything, as opposed to the AR perspective where you need to understand the physical world well enough to map those objects yeah. and then figure out how you're going to lay your world on top of that. Yeah. It's a trickier problem. From from a de- developer perspective, I actually think that it's it could be harder to do a VR world hmm. because then you have to uh, to create the whole world. Yeah. But from an AR perspective, you can actually take advantage of that the real world is all there, already there. I mean, I would argue in AR you can't mess with gravity. Yeah. Because the real gravity is always visible. And then with VR, you can, you know, mess mm-hmm. with gravity yeah. and, and play with the physics in, in a different way. Not necessarily for the better. So, I mean, AR in some ways is a more limited product. I just, yeah, I, I, I hope folks listening are as frustrated as I am. I thought it would go faster than this. <laughs> it feels like it's been a tough couple of years. Did you look at Magic Leap? I've certainly not played with one, but it's finally sort of out, and people just don't seem to be impressed. I haven't, uh, I haven't played with it. Yeah, uh, I've, I actually haven't read a lot about it either because, well, I, I want to see devices before I get excited. Right. Uh, and I mean, there there been a lot of talk about um, Magic Leap with the uh, with the fake videos yes. in the beginning and stuff like that. But apparently, uh, now I'm going to date this show a little bit, but uh, apparently uh, new devices are coming out mm-hmm. like a week from now or something like yeah, that. Yeah, apparently there's hardware out, but people are generally going, eh. Yeah. Which in some ways makes me feel better that it was just a hype machine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I want competition to exist in the AR space and for it to get better. 
but it doesn't, you know, it's just everything seems to be taking longer than necessary. Yeah. Or no longer than I want it to. Maybe it is all absolutely necessary. Could we've, be. We've had a couple of Intel, you know, TikTok revs now. The hardware ought to be better. We just got to see it. Yeah. You, what have you seen for commercial product? Have you got a chance to work on things? Uh, we've been working on some things. Um Mostly under NDA, though. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. And I, I, most people I talk to, it's all proof of concept stuff. Like yeah. People, it, companies want to experiment, but they're not committing to a commercial deployment. It is definitely co proof of concept yeah. stuff, yeah. Uh, or internal stuff. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm seeing a change uh, because it's... People get excited yes. about these things. We we do a lot of talks with companies showing up, sh showing off the uh, the hardware. And so far, uh, every company we have showed this to has bought a device. Interesting. So whether or not they're actually deploying it in the fields, another thing. But everybody wants to engage with yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I wouldn't think there's a developer in the world that wouldn't get excited about a Hololens. Yeah. I just wonder about. The executives, you know, the other people respond that are really responsible for the business thinking, what is the business opportunity here? Yeah. Like, it's cool, but is it ultimately going to help grow the business? And I think that's a tougher case to make. It doesn't seem like the commercial, like general consumer availability or success of AR or heck even VR has come the way anybody wanted it to. Yeah. So in, in Sweden, uh, I think it was Christmas 2016. Uh, VR was the Christmas gift of the year. Right, right, right. And, I mean, the headsets w weren't there yet. My, the Microsoft Mixed Reality headsets w weren't available in Sweden at mm -hmm. that point. So we're talking about Samsung Gear. We're talking about the cardboard stuff. That was the Christmas gift of the year. Okay. And that's not really VR for me. No, I, I don't disagree. And, and the real measure of a Christmas gift of the year is the following Christmas, you still love it. Yeah. And I don't know anybody who still loves their cardboard. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> DevStack, how are people building or how have you been building software at least with the HoloLens? So for, for the HoloLens, there are a bunch of different ways to actually build apps. Mm -hmm. You can do a UWP app. And okay. Then that, that we're just talking about the 2D version. Uh, you basically drag around screens or... or um, Which, I mean, I admit, I've used my HoloLens and literally just popped up windows on walls. Yeah. And yeah. that was pretty compelling, you know? Yeah. I mean, so you can write software in that form and then use it in, in the holographic windows. Yeah. And that's fine. Uh, then we have uh, HoloJS, for example. So you can actually... JavaScript. Yeah, you can write in JavaScript if, you, if you're... If you're... Uh, in, enjoy that kind of stuff because there was WinJS and nobody seemed to want to use yeah. that is this sort of fall in that category it's a uh, very weird flavor of javascript i i'm not a kind of javascript guy so i actually haven't looked into what uh, wh what it means to sure. develop with whole js as opposed to uwp which would be c sharp xaml yeah okay then that's a little more familiar yeah because in theory xaml had a bunch of 3d stuff i just don't think that we ever really went anywhere with it uh, no, I don't think it, we did. And, and the thing it, with, with UWP and, and the HoloLens, you can't combine 2D and 3D. Mm -hmm. um, at least not with, with the development stack that is available for, for, um, developers. Okay. So after JavaScript, what's, what's big? Uh, so we have, um, you can also use Unreal. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's I'm, the Doom engine. Yeah. Okay. And Carmack, I think, is the guy. Uh, and it, it's, uh, I don't think it's any official support at this point, but there are templates that you can build uh, for HoloLens. So that sounds like total gaming, right? That's generally what Unreal was used for. I assume so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we have um, Urho. What is that? Uh, so apparently Urho, I think it's pronounced, uh, is, um, is a Samarin or Mono uh, game engine. Okay. Uh, so it it apparently means hero in uh, in Finnish. Okay. Uh, so that you can write uh, C sharp games, right? Uh, and um, you won't get the you you have to code everything, mm -hmm. um, and you you won't be able to use you 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 won't have a, like a user interface like in in. Um, in Unity, okay, which is the last one, and Unity. seems to be the big one, yeah. at least for three D stuff, anyway. Definitely, uh, I believe um, last number I heard was like seventy or eighty percent of all the three D apps made for 
for um, HoloLens is actually made with Unity. Interesting. Okay. And of course, you can go the direct 3D route as well if right. you if you're if you want to. So direct being C plus plus, like writing low level. Yeah, I guess you can use like uh, Sharp DX as well. Okay. So there are other tools, but yeah. Unity seems to be the. I mean, Unity's got all kinds of tractions everywhere, really, as the cross-platform game engine. Mm -hmm. But works just fine in Hololens. Yeah. All right, and you've done work in this. Yes. What do we need to know about Unity? Like, what makes it compelling? Uh, so uh, Unity is a 3D game engine. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who don't uh, know what it is, uh, you can also develop 2D games with it. Right. So it's like side-scrolling style. Yeah. Uh, and the beautiful thing is that many things in Unity are, are already done. Right. It's so it's, it's library of visualizations and stuff is. Yeah. And I mean, just showing a 3D model is basically just drag and drop. Mm -hmm. uh, you write, you can write code in uh, JavaScript if you like to, but most samples or basically all the samples will be in C sharp. Okay. So familiar if you're coming from the .NET world. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit different way of thinking. You you develop, uh, you don't have like, um, if we're going to go back in time and talk about XNA and stuff like that, you have a game loop and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, with, with Unity, you don't have a game loop. You, you let every object take care of itself, basically. You attach script to a 3D model, for example. So you've got a 3D model of a ball. You're telling the ball how it moves, how it collides. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and, and that's a good example. You, you, the ball will, will automatically handle colliders, for example. Okay. You add a collider to the ball and you say that, well, when you collide, you're going to run this part of the script. Right. So, and I'm, I'm just going to think, think through some scenarios that you have a wall. You have, uh, and you throw the ball with a collider script in it, it recognizes that it impacts the wall, and then it's the collider script that decides how the ball responds to the wall. Yeah, and that so. one I think is easy. Now you get, uh, I can think of two tricky ones. Breaking through a window, like how hard do you have, can I actually get the collider smart enough to say, I require this level threshold and recognize this surface, now I can break through it, now I have to tell the surface you're breaking? Yeah. Or well, is it actually the surfaces, the, the windows... Got, owns the the other side of the collision decides whether or not it's going to break. Well, I guess you can do it the, either way. Right. But but you will if you if you throw something at the wall, you will have a force, and right. you can based on that force decide what what to do. But both the ball and the thing it's impacting get an opportunity to run code yes. in terms of a collision, yeah. so they can they can chat with each other. Yeah. So I'd also think. Okay, ball breaks through the window. The window says, yeah, that's sufficient threshold for me to break. But it's also got to tell the ball how much momentum it's lost. So it's no longer moving at the same speed. Yeah. And, and I mean, w when they collide, we, you're, you're, the window is going to get, yeah, so the ball is colliding with you. And the ball is going to get, yeah, the window is colliding with you. Right. So you can, so have they can a lot talk things. about that. Yeah. But that idea that a window understands its properties well enough to decide this is sufficient force for me to shatter. And I'm going to leave you with this much energy, or it's taken this much energy to shatter. Me. Yeah. And then the ball can decide how it moves afterwards. Exactly. The other one that I think would be fun to, to work through the math on is like being thrown into water. So that there's a <laughs> splash and there's an impact, but you are ultimately going to travel through it at a different rate. Yeah. Like I, getting all that math right is, is interesting to me. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of the math is. Um, there are a lot of, of um, libraries that can help with that. Right. Um, is, um, these are solved problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not a math guy. Sure. I'm not. Um, but it, you're saying that it, in the libraries that are available with Unity is a window already that understands how it should break? I am pretty sure there yeah. are, yeah. It's just it's interesting to think in terms of the gaming side of this, of being able to build all the physics. But, you, you know, I, I want to hope that HoloLens does more than just gaming. Mm. Of course. Uh, we usually say that, that it, it is a business platform that is game enabled. Oh, interesting. Okay, I love that terminology. Yeah, but, because I think that the r real advantage is going to be the the non game stuff. Yeah, that's the real power place. Yeah. All right. Before we get into that, hey Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? Time for a weird time warp effect in the middle of the show. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's back. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of want the Scooby-Doo. <laughs> now we're back at the studio. 
It's time to admit I was going to write a joke about a Japanese uni tea service ceremony. Oh, God. Oh, but I sprained oh. my pun muscles, so I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you just stab me? Could you just stab me, please? I don't even, I, you know, thinking about a tea that tastes like uni is just oh, wrong. That's nasty. An uni tea oh, service. Uni tea oh, service. that's just terrible. Yeah. You know oh. how sometimes you can taste things with your brain? If I said, <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, if I said like truffles and ice cream, yeah. you could actually, you know, vanilla ice cream and truffles, you could probably approximate that you can taste it right now, can't you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm still thinking about sea urchin gonads, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and ice cream. <laughs> Which kind of looks like brains, you know? <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> anyway, it's time to give away a free conference pass to Tech Bash, happening October 2nd through the 5th, and up to four nights at the Kalahari Resort in Pocono Manor, Pennsylvania, for this event. If you want to learn more about that, go to techbash at .net rocks.com. But guess what? Progress Telerik is giving away a ticket for this right now to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But first, let me tell you about the most comprehensive developer toolkit for building modern apps on the market today, Telerik DevCraft. With more than 1,100 Telerik, .NET, and Kendo UI JavaScript components and controls, you can easily build modern, high-performant web, mobile, and desktop apps, as well as chatbots. The toolset also includes reporting solutions, automated testing, and productivity tools, and comes with a range of support options. And new this year is a free online training program for all license holders. With this, alongside thousands of demos with source code, comprehensive docs, and a full assortment of Visual Studio templates, you'll be up and running with the Progress Telerik and Kendo UI tools in no time. Download a free 30-day trial today at Telerik.com slash download. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Michael Buck. Congratulations, Buck. He's my uncle. Is no, that true? Not. Uncle no. Buck. There was Uncle Buck. I think that just was John a, Candy, though. Just, that was a Canadian callback for y'all. <laughs> eh? <laughs> yeah, never mind. We miss you, John. Yeah, well, anyway, Michael just won a free pass to Tech Bash in October and up to four nights at the Kalahari Resort just for being a member of the fan club. And if you'd like to join the .NET Rocks fan club, Go to dotnetrocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and you're in the club. We have thousands of members all over the world, and every show we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the fan club, but you got to sign up to win. And uh, I know he's told us what he would do before, but did mm-hmm. you ask Jimmy what he'd do with $5,000, Richard? Why, yes, I did. And so it falls on me, Jimmy, if you had $5,000 to spend on technology, what would you buy? That, and I'm just, you know, I'm thinking about the beginning part of the show where you listed off like every single AR VR tech I could think of. And it sounds like you already have all of them. Yeah, people usually say, say that I have one of each. One of each, yeah. actually, t- and two of the good ones because, yeah. you know, you're married to a geek girl too. Yeah. But one thing that, that I actually don't have is a Surface Hub. Ah. <sighs> I love those. They are so pretty. Yeah. Didn't your wife ask for the same thing? No. Somebody was talking about, you talk about, oh, the Surface Hub, the wall mounted one. I mm-hmm. was thinking about the Surface Studio, the one no, with no, the no, sliding the, screen. The wall, the Surface Hub 2. The new one. Yeah. Are they, and they're, aren't they more than five grand? Could it, could I have a down payment? There you go. Made substantial payment <laughs> on one. And they made it like, they made like a 42 inch and like, and an 80. Yeah. But the 80 was like $30,000. And who's got a wall big enough for an 80? Oh, we, we do. You would, you would remodel do. to fit the 80. Definitely. <laughs> what would you do with this thing? It's Besides like, just, you know, pat it because it's so pretty. Okay. So I have a whiteboard fetish. Okay. I really love whiteboards. I can write on them. And you can erase them. I can erase them. <laughs> you can take pictures of them with, with, with office lens. Yeah. I know, right? And I mean... Think about having a whiteboard that is interactive. And also not white. And not white. Yeah. I, I, the most interesting demos I've ever seen on the Surface Hub were somebody else using it remotely and you're working together. Mm-hmm. So you're standing in front of it and someone else is also drawing it at the same time. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that Microsoft's just not been able to manufacture them fast enough. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a real problem. But okay, cool gadget. That's fine. I think, sure, we'll have to check in with your boss to see if it's actually possible for you to have one. But that's something. 
I want to get back into the conversation around Unity as the business development platform for HoloLens. Hmm? So that gets away from that gamey graphics and all those sorts of things. You still want to sort of have a 3D space. What's the scenario for building an app like this for HoloLens? Do you, do you talk to any customers that want this? Like, What are they looking at? Well, basically all customers want something like that, but right. uh, it's always hard to find the actual business case. Where sure. can we save money or, or where can we make money? Yeah. I've, I've, most success I've heard of around HoloLens has been manufacturing where they're getting away from doing physical iterations of products and they're just doing digital iterations. Do you think Unity would play into that? Uh, I'm sure it would. Yeah. I'm sure it would. So. Uh, one of the companies that we actually did an app for uh, is called um, SpotScale. Okay. Uh, and what they're actually, what, what they're doing there, they have a drone that is uh, taking pictures of buildings. Interesting. Uh, all the ordinary DSLR cameras. So a big uh, drone. Cause DSLR, big drone. Yeah. It's a really big drone. Really cute drone. Mm -hmm. It got uh, some uh, um, lights that, that actually looks like eyes. <laughs> but they actually are shooting at night as well? Uh, they want to be eliminated? I'm not sure if they, they do it. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they do it daytime. Okay. Uh, but so they're photographing buildings and then they're maybe looking at a 3D model of it in Holland? Yeah, they, they create a 3D model of it. And, and what we did was build the, the app that could uh, show the 3D model and, and look at, uh, at it from all angles. And you did it with Unity? Yeah. So there are tools. I mean, you're, are you getting measured? What's the drone data look like? The service that they provide mm -hmm. takes all this data and converts it to a 3D model. All right. And we got the 3D model. So they're handing you a 3D model in Unity? Uh, or is it a, a generic 3D model? Generic 3D model. Okay, like an OPML or? FBX, I think it okay. was. So the sort of standard format of a 3D model, mm -hmm. and then you load it up into Unity. So it, you really know Unity resources at all then? Uh, for that, no. No? No. Do you put a surface down or something? Like, how do you make the model feel logical? Uh, so for, for uh, to actually interact with the real world, mm -hmm. um, you can use something called a mixed reality toolkit. Okay. And the really cool part is that... Uh, you can use it for AR as well as MR okay. or, or VR. Right. So the Mixed Reality Toolkit is a, an, an open source project from Microsoft, mm -hmm. but it uh, takes contributions from the community as nice. well. And I do a lot of HoloLens and, and Mixed Reality sessions. And basically, every time I have to uh, rewrite my demos mm -hmm. in a good way. Because the, the firmware and stuff is changing every time? Or? Uh, and the the Mixed Reality Toolkit has new ways, better ways to do the oh, same kinds of things uh, so that I did before. you built a demo jumping through the old, with the old version, it was harder to build. And mm -hmm. then you come, you know, the next show a month later and there's been an update and yeah. now it's easier to build that sample. Exactly. Right. I actually had one demo where uh, I go through every step of the, I build a cube and, and I show how, how the cube is just hovering in midair. Right. And then, then um, I, I show how to interact with the, with the gaze. Mm -hmm. So looking at the cube, with changing the colors, interacting with gestures. And now all of those three are basically just one prefab in in unity uh, so, but it's just drag and drop and we're done here's the cube with all that interaction remember when yeah. i used to have to do some work exactly that's exactly. interesting so they are automating more and more of those pieces so you can get to the more difficult part yeah and, and and i really enjoy that kind of i mean all of these things are built into unity so i could have done everything from directly from unity mm -hmm. but having uh having components that makes it a little bit easier makes it a little bit better mm -hmm. um, perhaps take taking away some jittering functions and stuff like that yeah uh, I, I think that's important so sure. i can focus on what makes the app important right. to my customers the real value proposition yeah. figuring out where the floor is or the wall is that's not part of the what I'm selling. Yeah, although those things need to be there and work well enough that they don't bother anyone. Exactly. I think that's an interesting problem. And, and the really cool part is that using the Mixed Reality Toolkit, I can create an app for AR as well as VR and basically have the same code. Nice. I, I just so take we, away the virtual environment. So that customer scenario you're painting where they feed you that VVX file, 
that's easily rendered in VR as well as AR. Yeah. And so you can choose, they can choose what hardware they're willing to spend on as well. Definitely. I think, but you know, the scenario painting is really not AR-ish in the sense of it's necessarily interacting with the environment particularly well. It's just presenting a 3D model presumably in a relatively clear space. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in the case of, of the app we built, we, you could actually place the 3D model on the table. Nice, and it would stick. Yeah. That's always the, the, the you know, that's the, the normal parlor trick for the AR product is that you put things in places yeah. in the real world and they stay there. And I guess that that's the thing that Microsoft has really solved for us, mm -hmm. the environment or the spatial tracking. That, that is just spot on. Yeah, to the point where you stop thinking about it. Yeah. It just sort of works. And, and the beautiful thing is that they, they outsourced it um, uh, so that, that um, Samsung and Dell and Lenovo and all these other companies could use it in the mixed reality headsets as right. well. So uh, these VR headsets and, and the HoloLens are actually using the same kind of tracking. Right. I guess that's one of the advantages here is the, the tool that they've worked on you get to write it once and run in multiple hardware. What about Vives and Oculus Rift? Do they play in that space at all? Uh, I'm not sure what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, for for um, it is possible to to run Vive applications on the mixed reality headsets OHD. as well, but not necessarily the other way around. Um, probably not. Right. So, I mean, that's. We get into these isolated ecosystems. You know, I really want, I, I like that Microsoft's trying to have one code base run across all the different platforms, even if they're not able to get all of them yet. At least it speaks to a possibility that yeah. mixing AR and VR work. Uh, what about standard UIs, like a form fill or anything like that? Where, where do you go when you start experimenting with apps and now you have to do something like that in HoloLens? So in Unity, there are a, a UI library uh, to create like forms and, and, well, flat UI surfaces, basically. Right. Uh, so from, from Unity, you can do all these things. Sure. Of course, if you're in HoloLens, you really don't want to type. Nah, that's true. Do you, what, what are your, what are your UI ideas for interacting like that? Well, the the beauty of the HoloLens is that you uh, it it has Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. So if you want to type something, you can just connect it to a keyboard. You really can just put a keyboard in. Yeah. It. Is voice interaction a better solution? Uh, I I think it depends. Uh, for for most experiences, I think that it's very important that you incorporate voice interaction. Sure. It's it's more natural. Yeah, Even but transcription though, from voice is pretty tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, type your password. Yeah. Or speak your password for that. Yeah. That doesn't sound like a good idea. What about the sort of, I, I'm all I'm sure is if putting up a, a floating keyboard and making you gesture your way letter to letter is going to suck. Yeah. Like that sounds like the worst kind of gorilla arm you could do. Yeah. So you'll kill yourself trying to do that. I mean, in VR, you don't have a lot of options. Right. But for for uh, augmented reality, I would say that connect a keyboard because you can bring the because you can see the keyboard, yeah, right? Because you're still in actually in the world, so to speak. So it's not not that big of a deal. It's a solution to that kind of problem. Yeah. What about chatbots and things like that? Do you see that in the Hololens space or in the AR space? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I, I I really I'm really excited about chatbots mm -hmm. and and well home automation in any way. Sure. Yeah, I think that's really the future. Wearing your AR headset around your house, interacting with your house in sort of transparent ways. Yeah. I mean, why you, you can just look at the, win the window and see, uh, is it warm, is it cold? Right. Um, look at the light, control it with the HoloLens right. and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I always love those illusions of you're looking at a physical object and then there's graphics that appear that make it appear yeah. transparent or, you know, internally manipulable. Yeah, again, I'm frustrated. I want this future already, Jimmy. Why <laughs> doesn't it already exist? Why are we fighting to just try and build it so far? Yeah. Any other projects? Um, any other projects? Well, we're, we're working on a couple of apps, mm -hmm. um, which I can't talk about, nice. I realize. Yeah. <laughs> Living into your NDAs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that that we're actually going to go a, go a different route. Uh, I mean, um, w when we started off our company, we're, we were thinking about being consultants and help people develop their HoloLens apps. Sure. Uh, 
uh, I don't think that the mainstream companies are ready yet. Well, I would think the mainstream companies are more interested in when the consumer has a HoloLens, mm-hmm. and there seems no evidence that that's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. So now you're getting more into the you know, sort of internal HoloLens use. Yeah, and uh, so what 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 we want to do we want to build uh, apps ourselves right. and and uh, and sell apps instead. Okay. So present them as solutions to companies. Exactly. Here's something you could be doing with a HoloLens. Yeah. I guess it's an interesting angle on it because then it's less of them trying to imagine what to do with it and more looking and saying, "Oh, I see value in that app. Let's yeah. let's let's get it and start going with it." And I think that that everything that actually can help you in in your daily lives like chatbots yeah like like um uh, well augmenting uh, the the real world is going to be the future yeah i've got in my mind that someday these these ar devices will disrupt the smartphone that they're sort yeah. of the next generation smartphone but again you get back to this consumer play and smart you know i don't know if the iphone would have succeeded without the blackberry before it and the BlackBerry was always a corporate device. So I wonder if we're actually feeling around in the augmented reality space for the BlackBerry, not the iPhone. That yeah. we want that corporate solution that's so compelling, everybody wants to use it, and it leaks into the consumer world. But it starts with a corporate mindset. Uh, that's a good, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, way, and I way mean, to approach it. I mean, Apple and, and Google are, are going all into AR with AR kit and AR yeah. core. I don't believe that augmented reality is going to be a hit through a phone. Yeah, but as millions of Pokemon Go players that would argue with you on that, even as they're getting themselves killed walking in traffic <laughs> and fighting with each other over it and hacking a game. How do we get there that that's a good idea? Yeah. But they seem to be the exception. Yeah, so, so I, I believe that it's going to be a, a million dollar industry or even more maybe. Yeah, a million's not enough. Yeah, yeah, Needs but, to be a billion dollar industry. <laughs> but but I think that where where augmented reality is going to be the the real hit mm-hmm. is going to be the one that you wear on your head right. in some way, in your glasses or whatever. But we used to call them glass holes. I, do you have any thoughts about if we were actually going to make it consumer tolerable? Like the Google Glass was an interesting idea, but it got panned and, yeah. and criticized. And wearing a camera on your head became a problem. A HoloLens is nothing if not a camera on your head. Yeah. What do you think it's going to take to get over that social stigma? That's a good question. I mean, with time, I think things are going to be more social access- acceptable. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, both you and I are we're already wearing glasses. Yep. Uh, if you could integrate them into to that small form factor, that would be awesome. Now, is that just from an aesthetics point of view? Or as long as I'm wearing a camera and you can't tell I am, it's okay? But I, 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 I don't see that I actually have to wear a camera. Right. I mean, sure, the HoloLens is is basically is a camera, but there it's it's not recording anything. Right. It's just looking at the world around you and yeah. add, add, adding data. Although it could be, and again, you get into that sort of conflict. Yeah. I I heard a story from a Microsoft guy early on in Kinect's history, before it shipped to, to the public. They were testing with a bunch of Microsoft employees, and of course, that's when they were doing skeleton tracking, trying to figure out how to make all that work. And of course, the Kinect has a camera on it. So they're match- mapping the video data of the camera and looking how someone's moved to its 3D sensors being able to get the skeleton map correctly. And apparently at some point, the organizer of the beta test had to send to all the beta testers, please do not experiment with your Kinect naked. Because <laughs> you forget, you know, that things in your private spaces and you just don't get around to put clothes on and uh, it's a beta test, folks. There's people looking at that video. <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. But, you know, that's, I think, going to be a challenge of this. I, I find the social acceptance factor really interesting because the smartphone started out not being socially acceptable. Mm-hmm. You know, if we think back to the BlackBerry days, I mean, we called them CrackBerry <laughs> people for a reason, right? They were on them all the time, and it was socially unacceptable. Yeah. And our social mores changed. We just got used to the fact that everyone's carrying a phone and is willing to walk into traffic staring at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I wonder if the same thing would happen with a headset, that we finally get a headset so compelling you don't care how daft you look. I, I believe it will, but um, I'm guessing it's going to take a while. Yeah, it's not that not that simple a thing. In the meantime, 
somehow Unity keeps being the way to do all of this. It's just that much simpler? Yeah, it definitely is. Well, what do folks need to know to get started with Unity, period, irrespective of HoloLens? Well, basically, download it. And, uh, there's uh, Unity has a lot of tutorials. Right. Uh, check those out. Do you need Visual Studio? Uh, Unity is going to install everything you need, oh, okay. uh, including a uh, version of Visual Studio. The Community I think, Edition? Yeah, I, I think it's the Community Edition. Right. Which is pretty comprehensive these days. Yeah. yeah. Y- you can do it with with basically any version of Visual Studio. Okay. And then you're working in C Sharp? Yeah. Is, is it XAML too? Uh, not... F- uh, <laughs> It's a little bit of both, I guess. Right. So if you if you're doing it with with uh, for Hololens, you build everything in Unity, mm-hmm. and then you export it, and you will actually get the UWP app. Oh, okay. So you could uh, expand on that if you'd like to. To do work directly into it. Yeah, uh, but uh, you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> Good advice, uh, Jimmy. Any last words? Where are we going to be able to see you next? So next up, I think it's uh, going to be Techorama. Mm-hmm. We're going to actually talk about uh, HoloLens development. That's in uh, Netherlands? Yeah. Okay. October? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. And are we going to be at NDC before that in Sydney? Uh, I will be there, but I'm not going to be speaking oh, okay. there. Uh, also, uh, a short stop at the Ignite. Ignite, yes. It's nice how those two shows are back-to-back on yeah. other sides <laughs> of the world. Jimmy Angstrom, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me. And we'll talk to you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a...